Welcome to Agile to Agility Podcast with Milan Bayic. Major show alert. The very first value we wrote is individuals and interactions. Let's take this to another level. An effective product owner is going to activate a learning loop, a quick and hopefully cheap mm. uh, learning loop where we you know, try something and get Validate. an action yeah. from a real customer. Yeah. Who is Jim York? Uh, how did you maybe briefly get into this agile space? And then I think I want to discuss some of the topics around product ownership. So, yeah, how did I get Jim? into the agile space? Well, yeah. gosh, um, I guess a little bit of osmosis, a little bit. Um, it was the way I've always kind of thought, and and my 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 mind kind of works that way. Um, I, I started off as a management consultant and, and I found myself building applications, little boutique applications for my fellow um, consultants who did economic and cost uh, analysis and industrial engineering. And uh, I didn't have any formal methodology training. I have a mathematics and an English background. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it, with a loss of any guide you know, to follow, I just did what made sense. And uh, mm -hmm. so, I started off as a team of one, kind of did everything soup to nuts um, from the analysis, gathering of requirements, uh, building, design, um, writing code, testing, you know, doing deployments, uh, operations, maintenance, customer support. Um, face it, I was a team of one. Mm -hmm. So basically had to do everything. And uh, the industrial engineers that I worked with, I, I learned lean concepts from them. Um, and I was expected to be an eight hour a day billable management consultant. So, you know, all this building of little applications was kind of on my own time. And uh, mm -hmm. so I had limited capacity and uh, limit, limited, limited, um, uh, you know, time, time to really work on those things. So I built things in small chunks and they had to work because people began to rely on them. Okay. And over a period of time, I found myself building uh, teams because I couldn't do it all by myself. So I recruited, you know, similar minded people. And, you know, without a methodology, we just uh, kind of got into the work and I taught them the way I was doing things. And, uh, you know, so a certain advantage, you know, no shackles, <laughs> mm -hmm. no, no, uh, no uh, buddy telling us exactly how to how to build things. We just did what made sense. Um, demand. How did you get work. into the training piece? Because you're one of the earlier trainers. There's well, training was part and... of it as well, right? Yeah. So I had to I had to teach people how to use stuff. Um, mm -hmm. When I arrived at the company I was working at at that time, they only had one PC um, and nobody was using it. They had just mm -hmm. bought it, and uh, you know I was the only one uh, you know using it uh, until I started writing these applications, and then other people started to use it, and, and then the demand expanded and. They started, um, uh, you know, wanting wanting to have more computers. So I became the network administrator. Mm -hmm. So I was teaching people how to use the applications. I was teaching them how to use computers. It just it was just kind of a natural need. You know, you're dating yourself there. Just yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, definitely. I mean, I, back uh, back in the day, to just paint, paint the uh, picture a little bit more clearly, I was building the hardware. Um, we bought the first computer ready out of the box, but mm -hmm. every one that we built after that for the next couple of years, I built by hand. Mm -hmm. And I strung the cables and I, I, you know, installed all the NIC cards and, you know, managed all the, the uh, you know, the various connections. Uh, you had to manually move pins on the card to get wow. different network addresses and the like. So, yeah, I'm definitely dating myself. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, I found training is to be part of it. And um, I was also coaching. I was teaching others how to work as, as I was working. So I was acting as that advisor, mentor and, and coach. Um, and I was still that eight hour a day billable management consultant. Mm -hmm. um, so I found myself building teams. And uh, after a period of time, uh, some clients found I could build teams and they asked me to come help them build better teams. Um, so I kind of fell into the agile thing really by accident. And through the years, I, I met more and more people and uh, stumbled into the, the uh, Agile space through extreme programming and Scrum in the late '90s, and uh, in the early 2000s, uh, I had uh, the opportunity to work with Ken Schwaber and others that were early pioneers in this space. Um, I was one of the uh, CSTs that got my stripes by co-teaching with 
with Ken over a number of years. Mm. And, uh, you know, he, he essentially at one point knighted me and said, go forth and, and <laughs> make other CSMs. Um, uh-huh. That's all there was in those days was certified Scrum Master training. There wasn't, uh, there wasn't the product owner or the developer training or any of the, the advanced classes. You, you basically took people as far as they could go. Mm-hmm. What do you remember about Ken and uh, uh, how did you meet him? Is that... How did I meet Ken? Um, well, let me see. I think I originally met Ken in, when I took my, my CSM. Uh, mm-hmm. It was 2004. It was, uh, I believe, November of 2004. I went up to, to uh, Boston um, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, a little town outside of Boston, uh, we, we had a class. And I was working for a client at that time, and the client was adopting Agile in a big way. It was a large financial organization here on the East Coast. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were interested in having Ken come and train for them. And I said, oh, well, I, I can help with that. And I made the arrangements to bring Ken down and uh, you know to teach the class there. And that was December of 2004. And, mm-hmm. uh, and Ken arranged for... Uh, four of us to co-train with him for that CSM class, for that financial services client. Um, I'm trying to remember all the, the folks that were there, but um, I remember Bill Wake. He was, he was one of the people that was co-training along oh, with yeah. us. And Bill was also working with, with me at that time down at that uh, financial services client. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, uh, I met Ken through that experience and, um, you know, we became friends and I co-trained with him. I also had, uh, you know, along for the journey at that time, we, we had, uh, oh gosh, Kurt Peterson, um, who helped Ken create the original, well, not the original, but to improve, I should say, upon the original CSM class. And we incorporated the materials, um, you know, with the uh, support and uh, blessing of Mike Cohn. Um, so we, we always joked about we had Ken Schwaber and Mike Cohn, and it was the Dow and the how. So <laughs> Ken is the philosophical kind of leader. So he was the Dow, and Mike Cohn is, is he's the pragmatist, and he was the how you do things. So we had the Dow and the how. And Kurt Peterson, he introduced a theatrical element to this. Um, he had a theater background, so a lot of the a lot of the exercises um, and the improvisational kinds of techniques that you see in the training that that many of the trainers still do today um, have their roots in you know, what Kurt Peterson contributed to the movement. Nice. And of course, nice. Kurt worked with Matt Smith, an improv artist out of Seattle. And um, so we had an interesting blend, an eclectic mix uh, that came about and uh, I think I was like number seventeen uh, CST. Um, yeah, I remember. Yeah, I remember you and I talking. That it was yeah, small, small, and early on. So and we had was... no separate coaching, right? I mean, it was all wrapped mm-hmm. in. When you were a CST at mm-hmm. that time, you had to be a coach. So mm-hmm. yeah, we had a bifurcation in that. In the I got to about two thousand and eight when the Scrum Alliance created the cer- the certification program, the guide level for the for the coaches. So we had mm-hmm. the certified uh, scrum coach originally. Now we're certified oh, yeah, agile yeah. coaches and that's yeah. further bifurcated into team coaches and enterprise coaches. So mm-hmm. I think really you're, you're a team coach and an enterprise coach, right? Correct. Cause uh, yeah, apparently yes. when you, uh, uh, I think I may have been, I'm not sure uh, scrum coach. And then when they changed, it was enterprise agile coach. And then when they introduced the C uh, certified team coach, you essentially become a team coach uh, by default or something like that. Right. Well, it, you know, you, you would already hit like the, the peak of the guide level with the, with the certified uh, scrum coach. So yeah. certified team coach was kind of a stepping stone towards that, or at least that how it was, mm-hmm. how it was originally envisioned. It's kind of changed a little bit since then, but it is. And I think there's that like, distinction i don't know but like and i don't know what to make of it but like there there are enterprise agile coaches that are trainers but they are trainers that are not enterprise agile coaches and vice versa enterprise agile coaches that are not trainers and uh, Mm -hmm. i think you know like you said the training and coaching is part of the whole kind of experience and and skill set that you need to have as a um as a uh trainer and coach and uh, another thing is that that's part of that skill set is uh understanding business and i think a lot of trainers and a lot of scrum masters and coaches and even uh, you know uh, sadly product owners don't really know what product ownership is about so i thought maybe we spent a little bit of time um 
for a decent amount of time, I, I really want to dive deeper into the product ownership. Um, so maybe to start with, how do you define a product? Because if you own a product uh, and, and your product owner, product backlog, I think it would be helpful to hear your perspective on what is product. Yeah, the product is, you know, it's, uh, it's one of the big questions that often comes about anytime I'm coaching uh, within an organization. And it often comes about during trainings is what's the product. And I don't think we necessarily start with the product. I think we really start with who's the customer, mm -hmm. you know, who's, who's the target customer. And then we think about that customer and, and, you know, using a, another approach, the jobs to be done. So what mm -hmm. is, what is that customer's job to be done? And it's only when we understand the customer and the job to be done that we can start thinking about the product. And I think about the product as being the thing that satisfies the customer's need. So mm -hmm. the need that I'm talking about is the, is the need within their job to be done, which isn't currently satisfied optimally. So we're targeting a specific customer. We're targeting a specific job to be done within that customer's world. And within that job to be done, we're targeting a space where there's opportunity for, for making things better for that customer. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, I think of that product as, as not being the tangible instantiation of the product in this moment. I'm thinking of the product as that thing that evolves through time as that customer's need changes, as new technologies emerge, as new laws or regulations emerge, as uh, cultures uh, evolve and change, all those different shifting dynamics can affect the possibilities of what it is that is needed. So I, I typically think of the product in, in a nutshell as the thing that addresses the customer's need. Um, so that freezes up to, to come up with a variety of different potential solutions and, and also to evolve or perhaps even discard and replace a solution because it's not about the solution, it's about the thing that solves the need. Exactly. Um, what, what's your thought on customer versus user? Well, How do you differentiate those? Two? I mean, so the, so the classic, you? the customer classically is, is the one who's buying the product, mm -hmm. right? They aren't necessarily the person that is going to use the product. Um, there's, there's often this, this uh, you know, separation between the customer, the user, and sometimes the word client gets thrown in there. Mm -hmm. so, so client is a little bit more like user, except clients typically thought of as being professional services. So more of a services orientation as opposed to a physical tangible product. Um, so you know, the basic difference that I see between the customer and the user or client is, is the person who pays for it, who actually buys it, is the investor in, in the solution. And the person that uh, is is taking that solution and using it in in their job to be done, yeah. whatever that might whatever that might be, and and of course those two could be the same. I mean, you could exactly. have buys it is also the person who uses it. Yeah, and the reason that I ask a lot of times in my classes, uh, people don't fully understand the difference. So I joke around mm -hmm. and you know describe exactly that. You know, like if if I'm buying a bike for my son. Mm -hmm. He's the user, I'm the customer, right? And mommy is the stakeholder. Very powerful. <laughs> <laughs> what a very important stakeholder. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then if I'm buying a bike for myself, I'm both customer and user. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it, it, you know, in a situation where my, where my son is a user, he loves Spider-Man. And uh, from that perspective, you want to make sure that you design something for the user. But at the same time as that, our mommy... Or mommy has told us that you know we can't spend more than hundred bucks, so we're you know working within you know maybe a limited budget, or we can go back and always ask for more. But in a sense, you know, I'm working with the budget, and he is you know interested in in getting the bike that he likes. So if you're providing that service or product, uh, you have to think about both, right? Yeah, I, I've often thought of the metaphor of an architect uh, for a product owner. So um, back in the day when we were able to conduct classes at, a, say, a hotel facility, um, we'd be in a meeting room, typically within a hotel, and I'd, I'd call out, you know, think about the architect that was responsible um, for the room that we're sitting in. It's, you know, were they the investor? You know, was it their money? It's like, no, no, that's somebody else's money. They're simply making a design 
uh, within what it is that investor wants to buy. It's like, okay, all right. Is the architect, is the architect going to be uh, the user? You know, are they going to come and, and use the meeting facility? And they're thinking, well, maybe, but probably not. So I said, okay, so they need to consider the needs of the investor, the, the customer, the buyer. They have to consider the user who's going to be using the space. All right, so what about... Um, what about the uh, other things that are related to what happens with the space? Um, you know, often I was in Marriott's, right? So, so it was like, okay, so Marriott's, if you were in, say, a courtyard, for example, a courtyard Marriott, there are certain color schemes and the way that the building looks for most of them. And I said, do you think the architect had, had the ability to just discard those standards, those branding standards that Marriott sets for their courtyards? Or do you think that's a constraint? That they have to operate within. They're like, oh no, that's a constraint. I said, so okay, so as a product owner, do you sometimes have to operate within branding constraints and, and the like? They're like, oh yeah, yeah, sometimes. It's like, what about zoning regulations? You know, does, does the product owner can they just disregard the zoning regulations? No, no, they have to comply with those. Okay, so so local laws and regulations are things a product owner might need to comply with as well. Mm -hmm. What about all the disciplines related in actually building? building this facility. Um, so we have uh, structural engineers, mechanical engineers, specialists in HVAC, plumbing, electricity, you name it. So is the architect an expert in all of those domains? And I go, oh, of course not. I said, oh, but do they have to understand what those things are at a high level? Oh, certainly. They have to rely upon those experts in those domains to provide the, the information. They're like, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Is there ever conflict? I'm like, oh, absolutely. Sometimes there's fireworks. It's like, good, because healthy conflict is, is essential to getting the right information available so that you can then assimilate that into your decisioning process. So what about the actual physical building of this facility? And they're like, oh, yeah, there were people, there were carpenters and electricians, and there were all these people. It's like, yeah, yeah. You know, so, so does, the, does the architect have to nurture that that cadre of of people who are doing the work mm -hmm. um, so that they come together as, as essentially an ensemble and and they they actually work as a team to create this product okay, absolutely and while they're doing that do they have to manage that coalition of stakeholders the the investor mm -hmm. you know the the uh the zoning uh you know folks you know, you know all all of the other things do they have to do they have to make sure that they can hold that coalition together and preserve the integrity of the vision of what this is all about. I'm like, yeah, yeah. So, so I kind of think about what a what a traditional kind of holistic architect would do and say, you know, that's kind of like a kind of like a product owner. They have to they have to keep in mind all of these things. And I don't expect them to be expert at all of the various disciplines and domains in that space, but I do expect them to pull that together. Uh, what about decision making? And, you know, for, from a authority standpoint, and I don't know that much, uh, I'm diving into the uh, uh, construction space, but mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure, or I don't know what kind of authority I'm assuming depends they have. Who, but, yeah. Depends on who you hire, but I mean, I think the ultimate authority when you're talking about a, um, you know, an architect is really the customer. You know, at the end of the day, it boils down to, you know, that individual who's paying for the product. And yeah. uh, you, I, I think about that, the extension of that, it's not necessarily who's funding it, you know, the initial investor. It's downstream, are people actually going to buy the product? Because mm -hmm. that's what we're ultimately looking for is cash flow. Mm -hmm. And in the absence of cash flow, that product is not going to be sustainable. So it's, you're really looking, you know, taking a lean perspective on this, you're looking at the end of the value stream. And that's ultimately where your funding is going to come from. You might have some upfront investment, but that investor is looking for a return on that investment. They're not. But would that be that like the investor or the customer is delegating that authority to the architect in this instance? I think so. I think that's a certain um, trust that has to exist between the customer and and the architect or the product owner. Um, mm -hmm. so I want to kind of move away from the from the metaphor of the architect. <laughs> yeah. uh, they have to. Yeah, they have to. They have to trust that that individual is going to be uh, doing the best job they can to make the best decisions uh, based on what they know at the time. And then, of course, um, we want to activate a learning loop because mm -hmm. it's unlikely in the environments where product owners are appropriately applying agile techniques. 
that they're, they're unknowns, right? So every item in the product backlog is essentially a hypothesis. There's no empirical data that it, the decision around that item, what exactly it is and at what level of, of robustness or quality, if, if that uh, item is a good fit for purpose. Mm -hmm. So an effective product owner is gonna activate a learning loop, a quick and hopefully cheap mm -hmm. uh, learning loop where we you know, try something and get Validate. an action yeah. from a real customer. Yeah. yeah, and then once we get that that reaction, then we have some data. Then we have something we can work with. Um, but up to that so point, for it's that, all yeah. So for that, like, there needs to be some kind of, uh, or at least you know, and I think you would probably agree with this. Uh, in a lot of organizations, and it's getting better. People that are put into product ownership role. Uh, don't fully understand about that feedback loop and that validation. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. the second thing is they don't have the authority, even if they uh, understood what product ownership is about, they don't have the authority to, to actually, you know, uh, 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 make the decisions around how do I create some type of, what am I trying to validate here? How could, could I, you know, align with people that are doing this to, to as quickly as possible? validate going back to you know the jobs to be done or the problems mm -hmm. or opportunities that we're trying to help our yeah. customers with. yeah i think that's one of the biggest shortcomings of the way the role is 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 put in place in many organizations and there, there's many different models of product ownership um i tend to take a more holistic perspective cradle to grave so that uh, addressing the customer's need needs tend to persist through time they might mm -hmm. they might shift a little bit but needs tend to persist so I think of that product owner is, is owning the product over the entire product life cycle, which is as long as we can pivot and address whatever the customer's need is and how it's shifted, then that's a long tail. I mean, that's mm -hmm. this is not a this is not a time boxed exercise. This is not a um, this is not a close ended game. This is an open ended game, and we want to play it as long as we can, as long as we're creating value for the customer. Um, so in order to effectively do that, having a product owner is truly empowered to act in the best interest of the customer um, and think about both short-term execution and creation of value as long as long-term sustainability of that value and make decisions around that. So there's a lot of influences on a product mm -hmm. owner's decision-making processes and I encourage those influences. I, I wanna have uh, people with strong opinions, different opinions. Uh, we wanna get as much information out and available to the product owner so that they can make a better and, and better informed decision. Uh, in order to do that effectively, we, we need to fully empower that product owner. And um, I'm gonna use a, a definition of, of empowerment that I got from, from uh, uh, Rob Tomset from uh, Australia. He was a uh, project manager, uh, I would say, say suggest a project management guru. He wrote a book called uh, Extreme Project Management. And Rob shared with me years ago, probably in 2000, I think it was, uh, kind of what, what is meant by fully empowered. And he called these the characteristics of a business sponsor. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he used two very visual uh, metaphors here. He said the business sponsor needs to have the baseball bat and the bag of money. <laughs> and the baseball bat is the organizational authority to resolve any and all conflict within the product space. Mm -hmm. So, um, so nobody could second uh, or, or could second not second. <laughs> you could second guess, but you could, you couldn't. Uh -huh. You had to respect that authority when that mm -hmm. when that individual made the decision. No one could you could kind of usurp or 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 or, or take away from that decision. Um, so the second is the bag of money. It's it's not that there's endless money. It's it's but once you have that bag of money, that whatever that is, it's made available to the product. Then that business sponsor can unilaterally decide how to spend the money. No one can tell them how to spend the money. It's it's fully in their control. So you know again thinking about the product owner role in Scrum, um, the product owner I believe has those same characteristics. Um, if we look at the scrum guide and how the role is set up, this is the person who is responsible for the creation of value. This is the mm -hmm. individual who is managing the return on investment. In order for them to be effective in doing that job, they have to have the authority to make the business decisions. 
Yeah, and that's so like if, if you I was talk, talking to Daniel Mezik, and I think he articulated it really well uh, in a sense, like one of the things that he said uh, that kind of resonated with me and I've heard him say it before, but like uh, specifically, you know, and he said like the decision rights in Scrum are the hardest thing to do. And most companies try to implement the process, but to have a product owner that's truly empowered and like you just described mm -hmm. to have teams that are self-directing or self-organizing uh to have a scrum master that's a true change agent with, with that type of uh, uh you know authority is very rare for organizations um to implement and yet you know they're doing daily stand-ups and retrospectives and we're doing scrum and you know they get 10 15 percent that he calls improvement and they're happy and he's like, they don't even have to do Scrum <laughs> to, do, no, to, no. To, to get those type of results. Yeah, I mean, there's there's tremendous potential in having more effective decisions. Um, if we can if we can truly get the product backlog ordered with the most impactful work at the top, we can pull off Pareto and get an, an 80-20. Mm -hmm. And an 80-20 is essentially a four times return um, during that 20% of the, of the effort that we're, with, that we're spending in an initial part, we get 80% of the return. That's a four times uh, versus a randomized execution of items uh, in, in a list. Um, if somebody's saying, oh, we got a lift of 15 or 20%, like you're, you, you're telling me you've done everything in Scrum um, except improve your process and improve your decision making. <laughs> Because it's not just four times the value potential by having a Pareto uh, possible. It's also that Scrum Master having the, the ability to work with the organization to improve its delivery process. And if we can get an, an, a shorter cycle time, for example, mm -hmm. um, by eliminating a lot of the waste and the handoffs, uh, by working together as a team, as opposed to having it go through silos in the organization, when you do that, you can you can shorten the cycle time substantially, easily by multiples, um, at least at least uh, twice as fast. Um, I remember one organization I worked with; they were um, they were implementing change requests, and they had a manager that would take in the request, and they'd say, "Oh, I need a I need an analyst, and I need a developer, and I need a tester, and I need somebody to fix the documentation." And, and they go into this matrix pool of available people, and they'd find one of each of these people. Um, and try to find an opening in their schedule and get them all together. And we would have a discussion about, okay, we've got this, this request. And then we would send the, you know, a, a requirements uh, analyst off to have a conversation and document the customer's request. And then this manager would try to find a time to coordinate all the people to come back together again, to walk through the documentation of that request and then hand it off to somebody who's going to do the, the design changes for And that. if you've ever done that, you know you know what that looks like and, uh -huh. and how difficult that is. And you're always behind and you always feel like, you know, yeah, you're well, driving it. And <laughs> it seems like the wrong person is driving it all the time. Well, that uh, that's, and yeah. you have, you have uh, things that slip through and you have, you know, you have to make fixes and you kind of have to go back. Their average cycle time to get even the minors, minors change, it would be something like, oh, change the case of this word from lowercase to uppercase. Mm -hmm. Literally, their cycle time on average was three weeks to make any change and from, and from all these kind of minor, minor requests. And what they decided to do instead was we're just going to take a group of people, a team essentially, and have them, you know, include the various skills that were necessary to make the average change. So you'd have somebody who could do analysis, somebody who could do design, somebody who could code, somebody who could test, somebody who could do documentation. And that became essentially a pod or a team. And when a requester had a request and it popped to the top of the queue, they would look and see, well, what teams are available? Okay, well, let's assign it to this team. And they would call up the customer and say, can you show up on Tuesday at 930? And so the customer would walk in the door at 930 and they'd walk into a room and here's here's these these people. And they'd say, well, what do you need? And they'd start describing what their needs were. And they shorten their cycle time, including deployment from three weeks down to three hours. The average cycle time don't went fully from three weeks to grasp. Three uh, and I, I know, you know, I, I didn't initially grasp the importance of that feedback loop and that cycle, right? Mm. The, the, the shorter the, and I don't know who it was that was describing and said, you know, 
uh, maybe it was, uh, I'm not sure. I, I was interviewing somebody and they said, if I could describe agile in, in, in a simple terms, it's about how, how short of a feedback loop can we create and validate things? Yeah, how fast can we learn? Yeah, how fast can we learn? Yeah, and, and we're learning about a lot of things that are happening simultaneously. We're learning about the product. We're learning about the customer's job to be done and how our product mm -hmm. fits into that. So there's this whole stream of things that are product related where we activate these really fast learning loops. But it's also our processes, mm -hmm. right? So it's, our, it's, it's learning what works and what doesn't work and how to improve our processes. And um, we also have that human dynamic of our relationships, because a lot of the, the things that are going on within an agile team are, are kind of a social or emotional level. And how do, how do we work with a new requester? You know, hey, we've never worked with this individual before. What are their preferences? Um, do, do they trust us? And, and we learn over time how to uh, accelerate that process of building trust and, and learning you know, the dynamics of, of the human system. How do, we, how do we work with the various stakeholders? And that very quickly grows beyond what was often traditionally thought of as, as the traditional Scrum team, which was the coders and the testers and the documentation specialists. And what we've seen in the latest version of the Scrum Guide, this 2020 issue of the Scrum Guide, is, is that concept of the Scrum team has expanded to include customer support, operations, maintenance, mm -hmm. um, strategy, sales, marketing. Those are all considered to be developers in the Scrum framework. And this is the way it's now expressed in the 2020 version of the Scrum Guide. But those are new words. That's not new spirit. The spirit oh, of Scrum right. is the same from the early days. It was a whole team concept. It's simply through implementation over the subsequent years that it, it got kind of scaled down and more myopic to being, oh, it's just the development group. And we see some implementations where literally it's only coders that are doing Scrum and testers and and uh, you know the uh, UX folks and others are kind of shoved off to the periphery. Um, not a very good instantiation of Scrum. <laughs> no, but and like- organizations you know, do that. You just remind me in a sense, like going back to the, uh, 2020 version of the Scrum Guide, and I think I have personal issues sometimes with the uh, with the Scrum Guide. Sometimes I don't, but it's like, and some some of the issues that I have is, okay, I understand that we have to dumb it down in order to understand it, but a lot of times it's also like unpack the what's behind it, right? Mm -hmm. Like why are you putting this in the Scrum Guide? And I think uh, another example which I like is, is getting rid of roles and putting accountabilities. Because Accountability, I think yeah. as we're dealing more and more with complexity, mm -hmm. it's not about like, it's about understanding complexity and how to understand the patterns and how to context and how to work within the situation that you're uh, uh, at rather than just saying, oh, the Scrum guy says this on page 10 and that, therefore this is what I do, right? Just blindly applying something without fully mm -hmm. understanding it. And I think coming back to the roles, uh, getting rid of roles, putting accountability, we're moving towards almost, not almost, but as, as a group of people working to solve problems. It doesn't matter who's the scrum master, who's the product owner, who's the developer. They're all expected to be able, similar to leadership, they're all expected to come and step into these roles. Yeah. But it is helpful to at least at times clarify the accountability Mm -hmm. So it makes sense to, to focus on accountabilities rather than roles. Yeah, when we talk about a you know a soccer team, you know we have we have team members, right? And we have a team member, for example, that's called a goalie, right? Mm -hmm. We don't talk about um, who's going to play the role of goalie, <laughs> right? Um, when we talk about the goalie, we talk about their accountabilities. You know, what, what is the, the purpose of the role? What is, what, what is their, their reason for being on the team? And then we talk about their rights and, and responsibilities. And, and um, you know, not every team member has the same rights and responsibilities. There's only one goalie on the field uh, for a given side uh, in a game. You know, you, you, if somebody else tries to act in that way, you get penalties, right? So, mm -hmm. Um, but I think although when you do play street soccer, uh, we, we uh, anybody can jump and play the goal. Obviously, no, no, you can't use your hands, uh, but but at least the one that I played and uh, oh, certainly, certainly. 
Well, and you can also jump in there and use your hands. You just have to be willing to accept the consequences. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, true. Uh, yeah. Uh, which reminds me of, uh, I don't know, I think uh, somebody within our community was saying like how there are different uh, versions of Scrum and how there are different versions of American football. And, and it made me think about, yeah, there are different versions of soccer, you know, the, the type of, especially the street soccer uh, mm -hmm. that I've played is different than, you know, what a professional FIFA rules are around, mm -hmm. you know, the game. Um, but it's still soccer in a sense, you know, uh, it, it's slightly different. And I think when you apply that to Scrum, um, you know, is Scrum in that way? Are there different versions of Scrum uh, the way that there are different versions of soccer? I don't know. It just made me think of uh, that analogy. Yeah. Uh, I think the whole idea of, you know, staying true to the spirit of the game is, mm -hmm. is you know, and uh, you and I as coaches, I mean, that's what we do with organizations and the teams that we work with. It's let's let's stay true to the spirit of this. And um, don't, not, not worry so much about uh, policing the rules so much, mm -hmm. um, but we do want to make sure we, we realize the underlying intent of this. Mm -hmm. and, and, and of course, there's always um, fit for purpose with the approach, you know, is, is an agile approach even appropriate within the nature of the environment that, oh, that right. the organization mm -hmm. finds itself? Um, if you're in the business of cranking widgets and that's how you make money and that's how you satisfy customers or there's not a lot of innovation, Agile might not be the tool to pull out of the toolkit. Um, you might want to apply something more along the lines of a Six Sigma process, for example. So I think that's staying true to understanding the underlying intent of the various tools in the toolbox and pulling out the Agile tools when we're in the context that where those are appropriate and pulling out the, you know, the, the more prescriptive or uh, standard operating procedure or Six Sigma type of, of things when we're in environments that are you know, more complicated than complex. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on uh, when it comes to sticking with the Scrum Guide 2020 and the, uh, you know, the product goal and uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, you know, so the product goal, I think is, uh, is an interesting, um, and again, it's not an ad, you know, the focus has been a core value of Scrum from day one. And uh, I'm sure you've seen it, million in, in the various product backlogs that you've seen as a coach. Is often there's an eclectic mix of stuff in there that's pointing in all sorts of different directions at a given point in time. And I think uh, you know there are things that are done in the Scrum Guide that are corrective actions that are reactive to things that we have seen. And uh, you know I often liken it to, to trying to catch lightning in a bottle. <laughs> you know. The, <laughs> Trying to capture something as as, as complex as Scrum in into a, a few words, um, mm -hmm. it's extraordinarily difficult to do. So I think we have this, you know, these various attempts, um, and it's like, thank goodness we're agile. We don't write it down and, and then say those are the words, and we're sticking to the words. It's we're writing down the words and going, okay, how did that do? And then we mm -hmm. observe for a while and see the behaviors. So I think the idea of a, a product goal, um, I think there's some really interesting elements in, 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 the, in this latest version of the Scrum Guide. The product goal, I, I like the, the, the words that are, the, you, you must attain or abandon one uh, product goal before taking on another. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, so I'm sitting here thinking about all the infrastructure support agile teams <laughs> that I work with. <laughs> yeah. It's like, what exactly is your goal? And then they're starting to question things and wonder about their organizational designs. And is that truly appropriate? So if the, if the rationale behind putting the product goal in there and being specific that they're going to be one and only one at a given point in time, and it must be either fulfilled or, or abandoned before taking on another, if that causes organizations to step back and, and kind of think about more deeply their current organizational design and if there is perhaps a better way. Um, I, I think that's, uh, that's going to lead to a number of interesting experiments over the next couple of years. And mm. we'll see. I mean, we're not going to know. We're not going to so know. The, you you think the, the, the emphasis on prodigal is to help organizations focus, obviously, but also to rethink their structural. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think a lot of a lot of the problems that we have is from unnecessary complexity in what we're trying to do in our organizational designs. Um, you know, 
if there's one thing that COVID-19 um, has done, uh, I think it has made us realize how precious time is. Mm -hmm. And we need to use the, the limited time that we have available to us, especially the limited collaborative time that we have um, to, to those things that are most important and to those things that actually require collaboration. So to have uh, you know, the establishment of a product goal, it's like, okay, that's a simplifying technique. There's one and only one goal. And, mm -hmm. and of course, that's not the only way to do things. You can have multiple goals, obviously. If you want to be uh, effective in delivering and you're struggling at being effective at delivering, Simplifying things is often one of the first techniques is let's step back and rather than try to juggle nine balls simultaneously, let's see if we can juggle one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, can we toss a ball up and down in our Decrease hands? Increase the complexity. Yeah. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's. Uh... Yeah. Once we've mastered that, then perhaps we can, you know, we can master doing more, more items simultaneously. But mm -hmm. what's the, what's the benefit of doing that is, is the additional complexity um, is, is the benefit that we receive, uh, offsetting the mm -hmm. additional complexity. And that's, again, that's a question that's out there. It's, I don't think there's a necessarily a pat answer for that. I think that's something organizations need to discover. Do you think the scrum guy has gotten more explicit on the backlog refinement in the 2020 or what are your thoughts? Actually, well, in many ways, I think it's gotten less explicit, uh, but also more clear about what it is that we expect to be going on. I mean, product backlogs used to have, you know, the different attributes, right? You had to have the mm -hmm. definition, you had to have the, the value, you had to have the estimate and, uh, you know, the, the order, and then the optional grouping, all that's gone from the 2020 Scrum Guide. It's like, no, mm -hmm. you know, we're not going to be prescriptive and tell you what the attributes are, are of a product backlog item. Um, you know, I don't know if that's good or bad that those discrete attributes are no longer there. It's not going to stop me from having conversations with, with people about, well, what is value? And why should that be something that's considered when you're talking about a product backlog item? And how do you model that value? How do you compare the value of one item versus another? Is, is a value something that is an actual or is a value something that's also like the level of effort, an estimate? Mm -hmm. Um, so people begin to realize, you know, in those kind of conversations that all of the stuff that goes on in, in product backlog refinement is all hypothetical. You know, it's based it on is, but it, at now, the now. end of the day, it's also about building that shared understanding. And okay. it's one of the biggest, I think, misunderstandings and biggest challenges that most teams face mm -hmm. is they don't fully understand that this is go, goes again back. Oh, I think we're supposed to be adding acceptance criteria. I suppose, think, but the underlying nature is about how are we getting on the same page? How are we building a shared understanding? Mm -hmm. And how can we do that without wasting each other's time? Right? Yeah. Like, how can we get to the shared understanding? Is like taking a lean approach with mm -hmm. smallest amount of waste when it comes to time, when it comes to collaboration. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of developers hate uh, hate backlog refinement just because they're either uh, not well facilitated or they're just purely waste of time. What do you do? Uh, I, you know, I have my own things that I try to help teams, but uh, how do you tr help teams with improving their backlog refinement? Well, number one, again, simplify. Um, during this last year, I've been encouraging product owners to reduce their product backlog, their actively managed product backlog to be no more than six to 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, why are you planning out longer term? Now, there might be some good reasons in certain environments where, yes, you need to have a longer planning horizon. But in well, we're trying to figure out this new dynamic of how we work together uh, when we're working at a distance and not in a shared team space. And that's, again, that's nothing new. We've always had remote team members. Um, we've just kind of never faced up to the fact that that is something that we really need to address within our teams. We don't, don't, don't necessarily treat them as equal team members. Um, but now that everyone is kind of on a level playing field, um, for, for most people still, there's, there's a lot of uh, folks that are working remotely, um, to simply simplify and make, make the work visible. 
Mm -hmm. And when you have a physical team room, you know, typically you have four walls and you can put your, your, and a lot of teams, unfortunately, these days don't take advantage of the four walls. They, they lock all of their product backlog and their sprint backlog into some sort of electronic tool, um, which is mm -hmm. fine. You can do, you can put stuff in an electronic tool, but don't lock it in there, get it out on the walls, get information available so people can see it. I mean, you walk into a team room, you can absorb a lot of information visually, but just by looking around at the four walls and see, mm -hmm. oh, there's our, there's our mission or our purpose, why we exist. Here's a product roadmap. Oh, here's the product backlog. Here, here are the things that we're thinking about doing over the next you know, quarter or two. Oh, you know, here's the current sprint backlog. I can look and see exactly what's in flight right now and who's working on what. And you can look around the room and actually see people working on stuff. Mm -hmm. When you're remote, now you are dealing with uh, even more limited real estate. You know, most people are dealing with one, maybe two computer screens, but a lot of people are looking at one computer screen. So it's like, well, how are you agile in 24 inches? Well, it's not even about agile. It's just understanding the fundamentals of communication, yeah. right? Well, like how do you how communicate, we communicate and collaborate? Yeah. yeah. And then how do we through that communication and collaboration, how we're building that shared understanding. That's really all it's about. Yeah, so getting, using the tools that we have available to us and putting the most important information out there so, and, and, and don't, don't clutter it with lots of other extraneous, unnecessary information. So having a shorter product backlog, um, if I'm a stakeholder and a, a requester and I'm looking at that product backlog and I'm like, hey, million, my item's not on there. It's like, okay, then it's obvious to you we're not working on that right now. You know, so making things obvious, I think, is a big part of the product owner's job. So, Million, I really, really want that. So you're going to push back on me and say, okay, Jim, prove to me why it is that your item is of higher value than the items in my current product backlog. And, oh, by the way, based on our current rate of delivery, it has to fit in what we expect to get done over the next six to 12 weeks. So that's the, that's the section of the product backlog. And a lot of stuff grows stale really quickly in an agile environment. The, you know, again, we're working in an environment where there are unknowns, we're trying to activate those learning loops. So we get smarter all the time. So a lot of the things that we had in the backlog earlier were put there when we were less informed. Mm -hmm. um, so many of those get overcome by events um, uh, just because they become obsolete over time. Naturally, other times they, they evolve into something different because we have better understanding as we go through. So I encourage product owners not to build out a really long queue, keep the queues really short, that improves visibility, that improves the team's understanding. If I'm a, a developer and I'm coming to a product backlog refinement activity, whether it's a meeting or just a hallway conversation, if we're talking about something million that we're going to be working on maybe in the next couple of sprints, hey, you've got my ear. Because, well, this is another part of, of a strong belief I have with Scrum is that idea of self-managing. Mm -hmm. I expect teams to become the teams they need to be by the time those items arrive in a sprint planning meeting. Mm -hmm. So I want to see it coming. And if we are not the team that can do what it is that's at the top of the queue and is being introduced as a candidate for the sprint planning meeting, shame on us if we did not call out in advance, hey, we need training, mm -hmm. mentoring, um, a supplemental staffing because this is just kind of a one-off. We just but that goes to back to the authority and then being able to get that. A lot of times teams are screaming and yeah. not getting that because really you implement Scrum, but you don't change any authority or yeah. how the decisions are made. And uh, at that point, things are going like, okay, this is Scrum, and you know you talk about it, but we have same level of decision making. Uh, you know, our hands are essentially tied behind our backs and yeah. you're asking us to do this. Well, you know, we have to test whether there is an interest in, in actually getting to done, right? Yeah. So we have to have a really robust definition of done, what that truly means. And that's the only way we, we activate that learning loop of yeah. is it a good fit for a purpose, right? So if we are going to implement a really robust definition of done, um, and we're going to activate that, feed, you know, that feedback loop, what that essentially means is, well, and this is, this is actually my favorite line in the Scrum Guide, <laughs> the 2020 version. The moment a, pro a, a product backlog item meets the definition of done, an increment is born. Yeah. I was like, so that tells me as a product owner how I need to craft product backlog items, right? So product backlog items have to be such that they can be done within a sprint. And when they are done, they, they become an increment. And an increment is something that is useful and valuable to a customer. So, so 
once I have a product backlog item reach that definition of done, I can show it to a customer and they could actually use it and give me feedback on fit for purpose. So that's going to tell me a lot about what I need to do in terms of defining what a product backlog item is. Now, when I present that to my team in a sprint planning meeting, if we now look at the way the Scrum Guide describes a Scrum team and who developers are, they're everything soup to nuts from marketing, sales, and uh, UX, and, and design, and uh, you know, if it requires a DBA, if it requires a security auditor, if it requires compliance, if it requires um, whatever, yeah, <laughs> along the whole Whatever coast, it takes yet to get to done, yeah. All of that has to happen within the Sprint. Mm -hmm. so, so what that means is that as a developer on the team, with the rest of my developers along that whole value stream, we have to all be there in the sprint planning meeting. So when that item gets presented and said, hey, team, you know, can you take this on in this sprint? We need to be able to look around and, and consider the entire value stream and say, can we do everything? And is everybody here? Mm -hmm. So that we're all agreeing as the- and committing, real, right? As, a, yeah. as the real team, not what's considered traditionally as the kind of the core scrum team, but as the real team that's gonna get this thing done soup to nuts. Can we say, yes, we will get it done. And if we're working in two week sprints, you know, we're going to get it done in a fortnight. Um, if, if we can't say that, then that item is not going to be ready, right? So we're not going to bring it into the sprint. Um, and a lot of times people use this ready concept to beat up the product owner. It's like, shame on you didn't make it ready. Well, ready is not just the product owner's responsibility, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. ready also includes uh, the requester. Mm -hmm. Is the requester going to be available for the inevitable questions that are going to arise through the act of building the, the thing that they're asking for? If the requester isn't available, we're not ready. That's not on the product owner. That's on the requester. Are we the right team? Well, if we don't have the right people with the right skills, knowledge, and experience to do that item, shame on us because we saw it coming through the product backlog. And if we didn't act on that, shame on us. Oh, maybe we did act and we made a request, but the organization failed to deliver on the request. Well, then shame on the organization, right? Mm -hmm. So it's it's a whole team effort to get these items to ready. So if we are if we are disciplined in our sprint planning meeting, we are not going to take on anything that we cannot get to done by the end of the sprint. Now there are unknowns. Right, so, so that's mm -hmm. just the nature of the environment. There are unknowns, but part of what I consider uh, to be a characteristic of Ready is that we've reduced the amount of unknown to a, to a reasonable level where we believe that we'll be able to sort that out by the end of the sprint. So we're never mm -hmm. gonna completely eliminate the unknowns, but we have to, through the process of product backlog refinement, eliminate enough of those unknowns, right? So, so that we can make a, a, a responsible decision that we're gonna mm -hmm. take that on and get it to done. So if we can instill the discipline, um, that means we would not take on items that aren't truly ready. And mm -hmm. you could conceivably at the extreme not be ready to do anything. Well, that's the thing, but like we've been so conditioned and like, you know, the teams know in back of their heads, but like in the past, we've been so forced and conditioned to take things on when they're not ready. When they're not ready. We've been, yeah. we've been you know, so like, you know, trying to just implement Scrum and not change that, not change the mindset of a developer that, you know, should be saying something and isn't, you know, when, when things are like uh, giving the team's authority to say no and not forcing them to work on things. See, there's, that's the back end, right? So, so, so if the developer is not willing to stand up and say, hey, you know, and that can be just, you know, learned behavior, you know, they're not mm -hmm. willing to step up because that's the way things have been done around here and that's what they've learned. When we get to the sprint review, and this is another item in the latest version of the Scrum Guide uh, that's explicit um, this time around. It, again, it's been true from the beginning in terms of the spirit, but, but this is now explicit. If a product backlog item does not meet the definition of done, it may not be shown at the sprint review. Mm -hmm. So again, at the extreme, if I'm a developer that doesn't uh, say, hey, we can't do that, we're gonna have a review where it's going to be obvious we fell short if we're disciplined and, and true to our definition of done. Yeah. So on the front end, we have the possibility of not taking anything in. If we fail on that and we take things in, even though we're not ready on the back end, we'll get caught. Yeah. We'll get called out on that. 
and that, even yeah and I, I what i like about that is even if you know i joke around but a lot of teams are demoing to themselves nobody's shown they're not really getting any feedback from the customer but even that it makes it explicit don't even you know uh don't show it to yourselves don't don't, don't show it don't show it it can't be shown yeah so this is you know we talked about feedback loops and 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 accelerating learning so one of the things i'm always questioning coming in as a coach in my own mind is when somebody says hey we want to be agile i'm like well what does that mean to you and mm -hmm. if what it means to them is that we want to get to done i mean we want to have a shorter cycle time and truly get to done and so there's actually a learning loop here um, for us as coaches and for the customers, the clients that we work with, is that when we work with the teams to instill these disciplines, when the team doesn't accept the things into the sprint because they're not ready, mm -hmm. does the organization hear that feedback and then act on it? If they fail to act on it, that's a signal perhaps that the organization wasn't really meaning it when they said it was important to get to done. Um, and likewise, on the back end, if we show up at the sprint review and we have nothing to show because we accepted things into the sprint that we couldn't truly get to done, that's going to be obvious to everyone. And so that's going to be new information, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And again, those same same individuals who are saying getting it done is important, they're going to go, okay, we, we, we're falling short of that. So here's the information on why we're falling short. That's part of the retrospective is wh where are the opportunities to improve? How can we close this gap between what our current state is not being able to get it done and what we think could incrementally get us towards a, a, an ability to get it done? Um, if the organization fails to act on that, um, again, that's feedback. Well, that's the thing. And like, I think most organizations that are, haven't gone to, they, they don't take their um, uh, definition of done or what they define as definition of done too seriously. So it's just like, hey, as long as you make progress or, you know, just keep mm -hmm. working on it. I think that's um, maybe as a last question here, as we're running out of time, um, what is, you know, one advice that you would give? To product owners uh, when it comes to product owners? One bit of advice, you will make mistakes. You will make mistakes. The measure of an effective product owner is your response and your, your uh, ability to, uh, to remediate the mistakes that you make. So you, you are human, you will make those mistakes.